Um, before I get started on, on, on the topic, I wanted to um, just declare that I'm not exactly a Grutenberg scholar or uh, my part of mathematics might not at first be thought of as being really um, related to Grutenberg in, in some ways. I come from computer science first, theoretical computer science, and from there, logic and domain theory and things like that. And in recent years, I've been interested in point-free topology. So um, there are certainly points of contact between those things, between Britain and mathematics and those, but they are pretty, you know, kind of kind of tangential, it seems to me. Uh, but nevertheless, one of the reasons why I was interested in helping to organize this conference in the first place and, and, uh, is that it seems to me that uh, Grittendieck's legacy really reaches quite a bit farther out than the specific things that he was interested in and much of what has been talked about this week. Um, he, he, he was really more influential than, than just those things. And that certainly is true for algebraic logic and the parts of mathematics that I'm interested in. Is, his influence is there, even though it's oftentimes kind of silent. People don't necessarily uh, cite him, but the influence is definitely there. And one of the main influences, it seems to me, <clears throat> that's really quite important, and that's what I that's, that's what I want to talk about a little bit today, is um, I mean, quite clearly, we've seen one of the themes this week is that the study of algebraic objects, these kind of finitary combinatorial objects that involve rules of manipulation are very often um, better understood if one moves to a more topological or analytic view of those very same things and vice versa. Very often topological ideas, analytic ideas benefit from being seen as a, as a part of algebra. And it seems to me that that's, that's an idea that certainly goes beyond from the and certainly predates from. But one of the things that it seems to me that he brought to the table um, from my reading and from my hearing a lot of other people talk about this is that I think fundamentally he thought these were not really one, one thing being viewed from another point of view or this being viewed from this point of view, but they are the same thing. You're studying the same phenomena, not studying one with the tools of the other. And that's a very, I, I think that's really an insightful point uh, and that definitely is a, a extremely influential in my part of mathematics. And I think one of the earliest examples of that, uh, in again, in, from from the point of view of a theoretical computer scientist, was uh, Dana Scott's um, construction of a model of the untyped lambda complex. Um, that seems very far from from Gartney's interest, I suppose. Um, but what Scott did was he took these combinatorial, this combinatorial system of rewrite rules for untyped lambda calculus and, um, and found a model that was like a, a non-trivial model for that. And he did so exactly by using topological ideas, right? He, his model is a model of a space X that he shows is homeomorphic to its own exponential space. And that's what you need for a model of untyped lambda calculus. You need x to be homeomorphic to x to the x power. Well, you're never going to do that except there. You're only going to do that if you take account of continuity in some way, right? So very early in this branch of mathematics that on the face of it seems to have very little to do with Grotendieck, it's, it's right there. I mean, it's, it's, it's right at the beginning of domain theory, this idea that we can study combinatorial things via topology and topology via the combinatorial things. And in fact, we're really studying the same phenomenon in both places. And that goes even farther in domain theory as well. And uh, um, I mean, after all, what is a program, a computer program? It's an algebraic object. It's a, you write something down in a set of rules and you have rules for manipulating those things. Um, and the, the usual sort of intended semantics is some kind of rewrite system even though the rewrite system is implemented in bits, it's still a rewrite system. Um, so that's, that's very algebraic and very combinatorial. And yet the, the way we have understood the semantics of computing has been via topology. Um, so I think these things are really much more closely related to one another than they seem at first glance. 
So what I want to offer today is just one example of something that I've been thinking about recently. And um, again, it won't touch very much on Grotendieck himself, but I think I will at least try to point out places where what I'm doing is, is closer to him than, 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 than you might first think. Um, so um, let's start with this. Um, a compact house store space is in a certain sense almost finite and, and well, not quite, but it's compact, um, but it's nearly profiled uh, in the sense that um, any closed quotient of a stone space is a compact house store space. And uh, conversely, each compact house store space is a closed quotient of a stone space. Now, what does that have to do with profiniteness? Profinite sets are the same thing as stone spaces. A profinite set is a set that is, is, is a, a limit of finite sets, right? And, um, and it's well known that those, are, those can equally well be described as stone spaces, right? Zero dimensional, um, compact. There are various ways uh, of describing it. But those are the same things. Well, we also know because of stone, that uh, the duals of stone spaces, that is the duals of profinite sets are Boolean algebras. So those are the analogs of classical logic. So the, the idea then is that one can think about profinite sets as the topological um, um, sort of mirror image, the dual of classical logic. So the, to the extent that you want profiniteness in your system, we'll come back to that in a second, uh, you might as well be studying classical logic. Well, now what happens when you want to remove the, when you want, don't want this nearly discrete kind of space, profinite so spaces, stone spaces are um, you know, totally disconnected. So they're, they're almost discrete spaces. Uh, well, what if you want something that's not so discrete, something that's nowhere near being zero dimensional? Um, then it kind of raises a question, well, or, or is there an analogous way of thinking about that in logical terms? If we can think of profinite spaces, profinite sets, stone spaces, as um, the, the duals, the mirror images of classical logic, then what logic would work if we were to remove this zero dimensionality hypothesis so that we have general compact house store spaces rather than only the very, very, very highly separated so, um, so that's what I'm going to report today is how we can construct a logic that allows us to describe completely uh, compact house or spaces and their continuous morphism, their continuous functions. Um, and a little bit more of motivation. I got interested in uh, just recently, this, this, the work I'm, I'm reporting today is fairly old. It's, it's, it's several years old that I did before. But recently I got interested in Schultz's uh, lecture series that I've seen um, on what he calls condensed mathematics. And I, I'm not very far along in this, but it's really an interesting subject. Um, so for him, a condensed object in the category is a contravariant functor from profinite sets. Again, remember, those are really just stone spaces. So from the category of stone spaces into, the cat, into your category. So you, you're looking for a condensed group is a functor from profinite sets into the category of groups, right? Um, satisfying conditions that basically means that you have a sheath. That's really what the, what the conditions are about, okay? Um, so immediately that means that by this duality of Boolean algebras and profinite sets, um, condensed objects are really the same thing as associating to every Boolean algebra an object in your variety doing it covariantly rather than contravariantly, but it's the same idea. So in other words, you could be thinking, it seems to me that Schultz could have been thinking about condensed um, mathematics in, in terms of Boolean algebras rather than in terms of profinite sets. Um, and, and again, the sheaf condition you can write down pretty easily. Now, let me make a little comment about this bit. Profinite sets is a large category. So the problem that has been coming up all this week of um, some kind of set theoretic worry is here as well. Right? So uh, Schultz solves this problem by saying, well, let's limit the profinite sets to a certain um, strongly inaccessible card. 
you know, sets that are, profile net sets that are smaller than that. And then things work out just fine because you don't have this, this uh, uh, foundational problem. And I might try to point out where I think I can, I, I think I can start to address some of that problem with, with, uh, with the way Schultz does it. Uh, not to say that he doesn't get it right, he's got it right, but to say that there may be another explanation and perhaps a simpler one. Um, so, so the idea is that I can think of Schultz's condensed objects um, via classical proposition logic, because the rules of profiling sets are logics, they're, they're Boolean algebras. Um, Schultz also points out something that's pretty easy to see once you understand what a Gleason cover is, won't bother telling you, uh, that you can replace stone spaces by compact house door spaces in his constructions. And that's really the ones that he's interested in in the first place. He doesn't really say that very often in his lectures, but it's really a technical move to move to the profinite case. He's really interested in compact house door spaces. And that's the profinite ones that are simply easier to work with for him. So um, that's another reason for wanting to understand what the logic is that's underlying compact house door spaces. Okay. Um, so let's start with, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with Jensen's um, secret calculus, but this is more or less a presentation of, of a version of um, propositional logic in Jensen's style. So the way you read this is, Gamma and delta are finite sets of formulas. Um, Latin letters AB are formulas. Um, and the arrow is meant to be some kind of formal entailment. I don't mean anything semantically. I just mean that there's, there's this binary relation between finite sets. And the horizontal bar simply means that, well, if you have these two entailments above the bar, then you also have the entailment below the bar. Okay. Um, and um, that's it. So it's just a purely formal system. Now, that may not give you much of an intuition, but the, but the idea is meant to be that uh, the arrow, when I say gamma arrow delta, for example, over on that side over here, what that's supposed to mean over here, gamma arrow delta is meant, semantically, it's intended to mean that if all the formulas in gamma are true, then at least one of the formulas in delta is true. So this is read as a conjunction of gammas, uh, formulas in gamma entails the disjunction of formulas in delta. That's, that's the intended meaning. But again, I want to emphasize this is purely a formal system, right? Um, this rule just says, well, look, if I weaken the premises by adding extra, whoop, sorry. If I just add extra premises to an entailment, then it's just a stronger entailment and everything's fine. If I add more disjuncts, everything's fine as well. So that's, that's what's called the weakening rule. That's what Jensen called weakening, right? So this is a system that um, basically captures the idea of classical logic. Um, and yeah, so, so this is just sort of saying the same thing. Again, it's just slightly more formal way. Um, these are all the same rules as I had on the previous page. So nothing really changed here. But the idea is to make this into a formal definition. So I'll call it a classical logic if it's a system that satisfies all these rules. So one of the things I want to point out is that I just say this is an algebra. I don't mean this is a Boolean algebra. It just has two uh, binary operations, two constants, and an LRA operation, and they mean nothing. All the meaning is in these entailment relations. <clears throat> So, so you can take these to be free algebras of free term algebras over some generators if you prefer it that way. That's the way it would be presented in a logic course. Um, now, for two of these classical logics that I have, I also want to define what is a logical relation between them. And a logical relation is, well, it has exactly the same form, but here I'm taking finite uh, formulas in one language, one algebra, uh, and finite formulas in the other algebra. So, there's, so the things on the left and right side of this little turnstile are coming from completely different algebras, at least in principle, they can be. Right? But I ask that, the, that this uh, turnstile relation be closed under all of these rules. 
Now, all of these rules are the ones that speak about tokens that live only in one of the two algebras. So that means I have to rule out the negation rule because it switches a formula from one side to the other, right back here. So the negation rule down here moves an A to the other side. So that you can't say that if you're in two separate languages. <laughs> and likewise, the cut rule doesn't make any sense because the A is appearing on both left and right. So I leave those out and everything else here is the same. Um, I just retain all the rest. So that's what I'm calling a logical relation. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> here's kind of a simple variation on Stone's theorem that says um, that if I, if I define composition of these logical relations in, in this way, which is a kind of version of, uh, of a cut rule, right, then the category of classical logics that I just defined is equivalent to the category of relations for the regular category of Boolean algebras. Boolean algebras form a regular category, and you can define what is a relation in that category. Namely, it's a span of, of homomorphisms. And, um, and this is the same thing as the category of relations on that category. And by dualizing, it's the same thing as the category of um, relations on stone spaces, closed relations on stone spaces. Okay. Um, so because I know that on stone spaces, I can recover continuous maps by taking adjoint pairs of binary relations, that means that I can get Boolean homomorphisms by adjoint pairs of logical relations. So it's kind of an easy calculation that you can actually capture the category of Boolean algebras with homomorphisms by thinking of these classical logics and pairs of logical relations that are in an adjoint relation with one another. It's sort of like the way in, if you think of relations, binary relations in sets, you recover functions as relations who, who that are adjoint to their own inverses. If you're thinking of them in an ordered way. Um, so, so this is not really quite Stone's theorem. Well, actually I do kind of use it here because I'm using the duality with Stone spaces. The point is that this category of, uh, of um, classical logics and logical relations is bigger than the category, is bigger than the dual of the category of Stone space continuous functions because it's really continuous relations between them. That's kind of the, the spirit of the idea, right? Um, now, here's something you want to notice, and this is something you should give as an exercise if you're teaching the logic class to everybody. Namely, all the rules that I wrote down that I'm now writing with double horizontal lines, that's because all of those rules are invertible. That is, if I know the conclusion, the bottom of that rule, then there is some, uh, there's some proof fragment that allows me to infer the, the thing above the line. Um, that's kind of obvious to all of us semantically, that should be true, uh, but it's actually just combinatorially true. You can prove it in the calculus itself. And let me just give you one little example of that. Um, right, so if I, if I have supposed that this was already in my system, um, the gamma entails something and a conjunction, then I can use this little proof to prove that gamma entails delta A by itself. Not a big deal. This is a really simple exercise, but you just know, I just want you to notice the ingredients. First, I use A entails A. I use these axioms, right? Um, I use, well, I'm trying to eliminate this uh, conjunction. So what I do is I use an axiom and, and a little bit of weakening and so on to get to the opposite idea. So I get the A meet B on the wrong side, so to speak. And then I use the cut rule to get rid of it. And that gets me what I want. So the two main ingredients are A entails A and the cut. And once I have those two things, I can invert all of those rules. Okay, does that make any sense? I know this is kind of not not the usual way of thinking about some of these things, but it, but it works really nicely. Now, um, remember my goal here is to think about what would the logic be 
if I were not trying to describe a stone space, but I were trying to describe compact house store space instead. So the unit interval, for example, instead of um, in, in, instead of um, you know a finite discrete set or something like that, Cantor space. Cantor space is a nice stone space. But what if I really want the unit interval? So I want to somehow smash together the endpoints of the Cantor space, the gaps. How do I do that? Well, so if you look at the proof of the theorem uh, of, of Stone's theorem, you see that the source of total disconnectedness is exactly these axioms. This is what that's, that's the culprit. That's what makes stone spaces stone spaces. It's the thing that makes them totally disconnected. That's the point at which you really need that the, those axioms is when you're trying to characterize those spaces. So what happens if we um, Oh, I, I sorry. I wanted to. I wanted to make another point here before I go on to the next thing, which is that the cut rule is also an invertible rule. That isn't quite so obvious, but if you think about how interpolation works in first-order logic, it's a very similar idea, right? If I have one thing entailing another, I can find something in between that only uses the vocabulary that's in common between the two. Well, if you sort of mimic that idea here, you can do the same thing. You can invert cut. Um, it's a little bit more technically complicated than that, but but not really any anymore, especially since this is only propositional. We don't have to worry about more complicated vocabulary. Uh, so all of these rules are invertible, and their invertibility is sort of semantically important. It's meaningful to us, right? Because saying that I can invert the conjunction rules um, is really telling me something about what I mean by conjunction. So, the, so these inversions are all important to us. Um, so now let's define a new kind of logic, uh, um, which is just exactly the same as before, with all the same invertibilities, but I'm simply going to eliminate A entailing A. It's the only thing I've changed now. So everything else is the same. All the, all the rules that are invertible at all I'm going to ask that they continue to be invertible. Now, remember, I need to I need to postulate all those double horizontal lines now because I don't have a entails a, so I can't derive. Right, I've abandoned the idea that I can derive invertibility proof theoretically, so I just have to postulate invertibility. Okay, but that's 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 fine. That's what I'm going to call a paraconsistent logic, um, and I and I'm I'm rejecting the a entails a. Of course, you can have it for a particular atom. You can have, you know, but I'm just saying that that's not part of the system. It's not one of our axioms. So this looks, you should look at this as saying, well, this looks just like classical logic. Everything here is exactly the same, including the negation rules. These two guys are just the same as, as uh, Genson's negation. The only thing is um, A might not entail this. It's a little weird, but let's, let, uh, humor me for a few minutes and we'll see whether that really works. Okay. So why am I calling it paraconsistent logic? That's another thing that you might want to think about. Um, classically, uh, we know that a contradiction explodes, right? You can prove everything from a contradiction and this is the proof. Of it. So as long as I know that A entails itself, by, by um, the rules involving negation, which are kind of the meaning postulates for negation, that means that not A comma A entails an empty disjunct. And that means by weakening, I can throw anything I want onto the right-hand side. So I can, so from a contradiction, I can prove anything. Um, but again, the culprit in that explosion is exactly the idea that A entails itself. If we, if we reject that idea, then we don't get this, common, this, this logical explosion, right? So that's why I've dubbed it paraconsistency, because this is, this is saying that you, you can, well, it's exactly saying that the explosion that you expect in classic logic doesn't occur. That's one of the ways people think about paraconsistent logics anyway. Um, <clears throat> So what I'll do is now define a category of 
these pair of consistent logics. So the objects are um, the objects are systems that do this that look like this. Okay, and the uh, morphisms between them are logical relations exactly as before. So these are relations that behave as if they are still just doing logic the way you should do it, but um, that's meant to be a semicolon there. The composition of the entailment in L with the turnstile is just the turnstile. So in other words, this is just saying um, the, 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 the arrow symbols behave as identities for this category because they get absorbed by the morphism. So um, this defines a new category and the cut rule, uh, because we've asked for it to be both, uh, it, we've asked for it to be invertible. That means that one of these arrows here is equal to its own composition. So it really, so the arrow is really acting like an identity on the object. Okay. So now I have this category of these purely formal objects. Um, the underlying algebras are just algebras and it's all completely combinatorial, right? Um, but now let's see if we can find a kind of semantics for, for this. And the first version of the semantics is just going to be a kind of more or less a term semantics. So if I define an ideal in one of these things to be any set that is basically closed backwards according to this turnstile relation, the, the, the arrow relation. So this is the closest thing I'm going to get to an ideal when I, I'm not in a lattice or, or anything that ought to have ideals. These are just combinatorial things. So if I have a set that satisfies this condition, I'll call that an ideal. And filters defined dually. And then I'll say what a prime filter is, means it's a, uh, a filter that has the property that if gamma entails, so if I have a conjunction entailing a disjunction uh, and the premises are all in F, then at least one of the disjuncts is in F. So it's primality in kind of the standard sense from Lattice theory. These are prime filters in the normal sense, almost. But bearing in mind that A doesn't have to entail A. So it's a bit of a strange, strange thing, right? Um, well, it, yeah, so, I mean, nevertheless, the, these, these, are, these are sort of the definitions of ideals and filters that you would have expected if you were just thinking of how they should behave combinatorial. That's yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, thank you. That's, that's meant to be in... Yeah, thank you. That was meant to be an F there, right here. Yeah, thanks. Um, so now here's the here's the first part of the 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 result is that the ideals that I just described up there they form a compact regular frame. So this is a lattice that has the the, the finite meets distribute over all joins. That's a frame. And compactness means that anything that joins to the top, there's always a finite subjoin that, that joins to the top. And regularity is just the translation of regularity from topology that you know into frame theory. So it's, it's a kind of an easy translation. Um, <clears throat> so at any rate, the set of, <coughs> excuse me, the set of ideals form uh, a compact regular frame and the prime filters form a compact house or space where the topology is indexed by, the opens of the topology are indexed by ideals and they're defined this way. So a prime filter will be in the open corresponding to an ideal I if, they, if the prime filter intersects I. Right? And um, because the ideals form a compact regular frame uh, and then with a little bit of extra calculation, you can see that the resulting space of prime filters forms a compact Hausdorff space. Um, moreover, every one of my logical relations, one of my morphisms, determines a closed relation between these two spaces. <coughs> um, so that means that at least one of my um, paraconsistent logics will determine a compact Hausdorff space. And each one of my logical relations between them, each one of my morphisms, 
will recover a closed relation between the corresponding compact household spaces. So that's half of a duality there. Now let's take a little closer look at that. Um, each proposition in my logic determines two open sets. One is the set of prime filters that contain the element, and the other is the set of prime filters that contain that element's negation. And because of the rules that I gave you a, a few minutes ago, those two sets are always disjoint. There's no prime that has both A and A prime in it. Um, and moreover, the, uh, the, the right arrow relation is going to hold between A and B if and only if these two sets cover all primes, all prime filters. So that's a better look at why um, this pair of consistent logic matches up with non zero dimensional spaces, like, like I said, arbitrary compact household spaces instead of stone spaces. Um, so it's a V uh, minus or plus? Uh, no, this is this is just plus. The, the, here is that where you mean? Yeah, it's two minus two minus. Oh, three. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. This should have been this should have been a plus sign. Yeah. Thank you for noticing that. Whoops. Where did I go? Yeah, that should be that should have been a plus. No, sorry. That should, this should have been a plus. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, you see the geometry. Thank you. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> okay. <coughs> um, so, um, right. So that, that basically tells you that this right arrow is really capturing something about the topology on the space. Now, so here's the main point, which is the full duality of this. So if I'm given a compact house store space, I can define one of these pair of consistent logics from the compact house store space. Namely, I'll take my language formally to be simply the set of all disjoint pairs of openings. Um, and I'm going to define conjunction of two of these to mean union on the positive side and intersection on the negative side. And likewise, negation will just be flipping the two halves, the two parts. <clears throat> And the other rules are the same. You just follow your nose and see what those mean. And then I'm going to define what the turnstile, the, the, the sorry, the, the arrow means. It will mean that if I take the if I take the union of all the negatives and the union of all the positives, that covers the whole space. That's that's the meaning of that. Okay. Um, now it turns out that so the theorem, in the interest of time, not spelling out all the details says that the prime filter uh, construction on paraconsistent logics and this language construction on uh, compact house source spaces um, constitute equivalence functors between the category PL, paraconsistent logics, and the category of compact house source spaces with closed relations, not continuous functions yet, but closed relations. Okay. Um, Yeah, I guess I'm going to say this in a minute. I want to make sure I've got enough time to say what I want to. So as a corollary, um, the category of um, uh, paraconsistent logics with adjoint pairs of logical relations is equivalent to the category of compact household spaces with continuous functions. So that's the one we were really looking for in the first place. So every continuous function actually comes with a pair of relations to say how tokens in the first one are related to tokens in the second one and vice versa. And the basic idea of the proof isn't very hard. It's just that these two categories are actually equivalent in, in a richer way. They're actually equivalent as order and rich categories, not just as categories. So that means that, and they're both the relation categories for some regular category that we already know about. So that means that I can recover functions by taking adjoint pairs. That's exactly what that should mean in a regular category. So the proof of this is very, very abstract. We can just, uh, we can just uh, you know, invoke all the things that people know about regular categories and we get it for free, or we can do the hard work of crunching through the combinatorics of these relations and see that it's also true there. So if you wanna do it computationally, you certainly can. 
So now I have a category of, um, of these kind of combinatorial objects, pair of consistent logics uh, with adjoint pairs of relations, and that's equivalent to the category of compact Hausdorff spaces. Um, so just to give you a, a, a kind of geometric picture of what's really happening here, the idea is that now propositions, think of this whole page as my, my space, my compact Hausdorff space, that a proposition is telling me that things are true in certain places at certain points and false at certain other points. And it says nothing about all the rest of it. So it's silent about some points. So it's either true, false, or I'm not gonna tell you, I don't know, right? Um, and then the logic becomes pretty obvious how it works, right? So a conjunction of two of these propositions means that, well, it's true if they're both true. And it's false if either one is false. And uh, everything else, the, the, uh, the conjunction has to be silent. You can't tell what's going on. Right? So it's a very simple picture of what, what these paraconsistent logics are really telling. So here's an example. And, uh, and this, is kind of a, this is kind of an important, useful example because it shows that we can describe a, a, a non-trivial space with a much smaller language than you might first think, right? So the unit interval is an uncountable space, but I can take my language to just be only the language freely generated from only the rational numbers. So it's a countable language. And, um, and the only, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna simply take the smallest logical relation that I can find, that just says that P is entails Q if P is less than Q, strictly less. And then you work out all the details of how that goes. And well, so one of these rationals um, is really sort of defining two sets of, of real numbers, right? The things that are above Q and the things that are below Q. And if I have two of them, then their conjunction is describing the things that lie between and the positive half. And the negative half is describing everything that's not in between. Well, it works out that th that's, those are enough tokens. If we have just a countable set of tokens, then, um, the, then my theorem says that the space that I get, namely the space corresponding to prime filters, is the closed unit interval. So it's much smaller than describing the space of the closed unit interval itself. Um, and it's a little bit of a surprise because it looks like you hardly said anything. You're just saying, I'm just going to puncture the, the line at rational points and then combine them in this logical way. And that's enough. That's a little, I think that's kind of a surprise, but there you go. Um, now, another thing about this, which is kind of, kind of nice in my, my view is that in this, um, in this category, if we have one of these adjoint pairs, Right, so I, I kind of waved my hands by what I meant by an adjoint pair, but I meant to say that if I compose them in one direction, they are below the identity, and if I compose them in the opposite direction, they're above the identity. That's what I meant by an adjoint pair. Right. Um, remember that those are the things that correspond to continuous functions. Well, it turns out that if uh, that if this thing corresponds to a topological embedding. That's true if and only if this is actually a split um, mono in this in this category. Uh, split mono where the other direction is is below, sorry, is above identity. And likewise, quotients have just exactly the opposite. So that's kind of interesting because that means that um, I have a kind of very obvious duality between quotients and embeddings which you would like, morally, you'd like them to be the duals of each other. But here it's really explicit. The ones that are below identity, um, well, actually, let me show you on the next page. So, so suppose I have an adjoint pair, and suppose that they have this property that they encode an embedding, then it turns out that I can use this composition as a new identity. So I can just replace in M, uh, it's 
uh, its arrow M, I can just replace it with this. And because of item potency, you can just calculate that this thing is a new pair consistent logic, right? Uh, and moreover, it's isomorphic to L, the one I came from. So I can start from M and describe all of its sub-objects just by enlarging um, the identity arrow. And I can describe all of its quotients by shrinking. This is just the dual idea. So that really does tell me that subobjects and quotients are duals to one another in the sense that I take an object that I already have and I enlarge its entailment relation that describes a subobject. And every subobject is so described. And likewise, I take the, entail the, the original identity entailment relation and I shrink it, and that describes a quotient. And every quotient is so described. So this is kind of a nice, um, I don't know, beguiling. I haven't really found a, a substantial use for it, but I think it's a really interesting One point. I think the last uh, uh, quotient of uh, satisfying. Uh, oh, satisfying. So this is this is a new relation which is smaller than the one I was that was given on the paraconsist plot. So this says fewer things are are entailed. Yes. But it has the property that um, it's still item potent and it's compatible with the original. And that and thing. Square, and then square and... Oh, I mean, meaning it's it, it's a, its own composition. So it composed with itself. Yeah. 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 The squares mean, mean self composition. Um, so I have this kind of nice complete system of describing all quotients and all sub objects. And they're all inside a bigger lattice of endo relations on, on the gap. So they all live in the same place. I think that's kind of um, interesting. I haven't figured out how to exploit that yet, but I find it interesting. Um, <clears throat> so um, I wanted to very, very briefly sketch why I think this is useful. And um, and maybe come back to a couple of comments about uh, condensed mathematics. But again, I'm not very far along on that. So recently, with Marco Abadini, we became interested in um, describing compactly generated spaces um, using the same sort of technology. So a compactly generated space is one that you can describe it in lots of different ways. It's a limit. Uh, sorry, a co-limit of compact house door spaces. And by the way, I'm, I'm interested in the situation where compactly generated spaces have a nice separation property, which is called weak house door fits. Um, so these are exactly the co-limits of embeddings of compact house door spaces. The embeddings part <laughs> is, um, is only true if you're using this weak, um, the weak house door separation property. Um, so that's all known that you can that you can construct compactly generated spaces as these kinds of co-limits. Uh, but now I have a logical framework in which to describe compact house door spaces. So we should be able to translate this construction into co-limits um, of uh, paraconsistent logics. That's 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 the idea. But also compactly generated spaces are, the closed quotients of locally compact house door spaces. And locally compact house door spaces, well, let me, let me just follow what I, what I said here. So in the, in the first version, the embeddings are, because of this, this result on the previous page, embeddings mean making larger, making a smaller space means making a larger item potent relation. So that suggests that a compact house door, sorry, a, a, a compactly generated space might be described as a filtered family of entailment relations. Entailment relations that are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, meaning the space keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger as we do that, and that they can all be carried on one language, on a single L. So I, I'm pretty sure this is going to work, but we're, we're just starting to work on this, so I, I'm not sure where it's going to go. Um, uh, so that's that's kind of following on that first first uh, observation. 
And on the second observation, Marco has made a little more progress on this one than on the previous one. Um, and it's really his stuff. And that is that we can take um, a generalization of paraconsistent logics for locally compact household spaces instead of compact household spaces. And the idea is, well, if you look for the culprit for where you get compactness, it comes from having a verum in your language. It comes from having true in the language. So if you eliminate that and keep enough of the entailments that you would have gotten from having the truth symbol, then you get locally compact household spaces. As the result, uh, another way of thinking about that is that a locally compact household space is the same thing as a pointed compact household space, right? Because I can remove the point, it gives me a locally compact space and every locally compact space can be one point compactified in only one way. So there's a functor between pointed compact household spaces and locally compact household spaces. It's, you have to make sure that you preserve and reflect the base, point, not just preserve it, but you have to preserve and reflect it. But that's a category of equivalence. So, um, so using that, we should be able to generalize these paraconsistent logics to locally compact household spaces, and then uh, figure out how to characterize closed quotients on those objects in this purely logical and get, a, get a, a second duality for compactly generated spaces. So that's the idea behind that, um, that work that we just, we just got on, on, started on just this last month. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, I'm going to mostly end here, but I want to come back to the Schultz uh, um, uh, condensed mathematics idea. And that is that if what you really want to do, let me go back. I, I forgot to add this last page to my, to my notes, but let me go back to where we were. Beginning. Uh, a functor from profinite sets to, uh, to a category is what Schultz refers to as a condensed object. Uh, again, with some sheave condition on those, on those functors. Right? Well, the sheave condition really amounts to saying that Co-products of profinite sets get translated to products in the category A. Uh, it, you also have to deal with filtering, but that's a kind of technical thing that he manages to remove. Well, so in my setting, that means that we're really talking about um, products of Boolean algebra is going to products in A, because it's now covariant. And as I said, the real target of all of this is to have the, the domain of this functor be compact house store spaces, not profinite spaces. Those are there kind of for technical reasons. Um, so uh, I, what, what that means is that I can now think about describing condensed mathematics, condensed objects in terms of associating to each um, paraconsistent logic an object in my category A so that I get this kind of smoothness out of the whole thing. And uh, even farther along, something that Pino uh, talked about just a little while ago is that functors into a category, if, a, if the objects of A can be interpreted as categories, for example, they are groups or sets, uh, then I should be able to think of this, this in this fibered way that was just described um, two hours ago. So that, that would, that, in fact, that's kind of my hope, is that that could be a different way of eliminating this, this foundational obstruction that Schultz has with these, is that, you know, right, these get too big, but in the fibered way, we might be able to avoid that, that problem and kind of give a better explanation for what, what his condensed objects are really doing for us. That's a long way away, but I wanted to at least report that that's where I'm headed. So um, I think I'll leave it there and there's plenty of time for, for uh, questions. <laughs>